<laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I want to ask maybe Hans Sulich first, um, what was the brief to the three artists that we have here for the invitation to come to the show? And how did that happen uh, in the process of putting the show together? Yeah, thank you, Vasilis. And it's, it's indeed, you know, really exciting that for the first time in the history of this institution, as Sam, you know, pointed out, uh, literally every single corner, every single also non-use space was available for, for the show. So in that sense, uh, for the artists, it was possible to work with time, you know, and space in a very unusual way. And it's actually really great that we have Rick Ritt and Rachel and Ian here reunited on the panel because all your three projects really connect to unexpected spaces. Uh, Ian's uh, project is in the uh, VIP room. It usually serves as a green room for panels like today. And it's never used for exhibitions. It becomes here uh, bestiarium. You're going to hear more. Uh, Rachel, of course, really looked at uh, many invisible aspects of the institution through a photographic aspect which reveals things about the Fonosio Bio we might never have seen before. And it's actually a little booklet um, which is available for all of you to take away. And Rick Ritt's work uh, connects to a terrace, uh, a lateral terrace, very connected to Ian's space, where all of a sudden a slow cooking uh, performance takes place and also a bar takes place and it becomes basically a place uh, of gathering. So in a way, all these three projects connect. And maybe we can start, I thought, with um, Ian's project, because initially we spoke a lot of this idea of a, of a living organism and, of course, also the, the dream space. Uh, Vasilis, you discussed actually with Adam Carson, is a living organism. And uh, the same thing is true for this library, which continues to evolve. In the meanwhile, uh, there have been many books about dreams added to uh, actually Frida's and Federico's um, you know, project. Uh, and um, of course, Ian, for you, the artwork as a living organism has been central for a long, long time, ever since you basically started to work with uh, uh, basically animations as living organisms. And then I always remember when we did the show at the Serpentine uh, a few years ago when Bob was born, uh, we had the opening. And, you know, I went home uh, and after the opening at midnight fell asleep and at four in the morning uh, I got a phone call from the parks and they said something really strange has happened that had never happened before, that the gallery suddenly lit up. So Bob, our first AI project ever, had decided to actually get up at 4 a.m. and not start the show at 10 a.m. And so here it's different because here it is actually um, a living organism as a turtle. Uh, it's an evolution of a piece. It's a very intimate uh, encounter. And it's interesting because I've actually came across the, the conversation Philippe and I did uh, with Paul Preciado, who is also here with us today. And we did this conversation with Paul Preciado many, many years ago at the Fondation Cartier, where we talked about interdisciplinarity. And Paul actually said um, a better notion would be intensities, no? In the context of an institution, the bringing together of different intensities generates a new set of relationship, kind of extending this connection to how an institution can also consider our interaction with animals and with the dad. And that clearly, Ian, your piece does. Can you tell us a little bit about this encounter with the turtle, what we can do there? Because I think every visitor, all of us, all of you, can actually have a real dialogue with the turtle. Hi. Um, yeah, so the turtle is a simulation, as Han said. I've been obsessed with uh, making these artworks that are they're digital artworks, but I always wanted the digital feel as alive and transcend the screen as real life does. And so I've been obsessed for 10, 12 years in making these uh, simulations that uh, feature um, agents uh, who mimic biological processes. And in the case of this turtle, we try to really take seriously the, the idea of animal level AI. And so my studio and I, we've been working on AI agents for many years now. And we try to simulate this idea of a congress of demons, this idea that your personality isn't just one unified thing, it's a collection of sub-personalities. And those things aren't always in agreement with each other. They're often fighting each other. And so the way the turtle that you see is simulated is that it's composed of many sub-personalities, different sub-agents, and they're attached to very, very basic identifiable motivations. So it has a hunger motive, it has a thirst motive, it has a, the need to find uh, a warm spot to sleep in. And those motivations, when they become very desperate and urgent, take over the body of the turtle, and that, like the hunger demon, 
can only start to perceive things are food, not food, and obstacles to food, and everything else is irrelevant. Um, and I think that's a little bit, when I think hard about it, that's how we feel when we're uh, very motivated by something. If you're very hang hangry, you're you're not going to see your friends. You're not going to understand or think about email. You're just going to look for food, what's not food, and what's in the way of food. Um, and so we try to program this idea that perception, your perception shrinks through your motivation, that actually your motivation constrains your perception. And this is a thermodynamic way that your brain can actually optimize seeing everything. It's the opposite of what babies think and what babies feel or what you feel when you're on psychedelics, where everything is overly relevant. Uh, I think most of the time we go through life where we very we cherry pick what's uh, of relevance to us. And that was a way to approach animal level AI in a manageable way. And it's something that I'm continuing to pursue right now. Wow. <laughs> Sounds so simple, but it's so complex. <laughs> Do you want to ask the next question or shall I ask it? Yes, I was very curious about the, the uh, thousand, which is the turtle, um, that it's trapped very often. Um, it's trapped, yeah, it's like it's, uh, in the environment that it has created. Um, this translates to if the viewer, to me particularly, I, uh, to an immense kind of like a, a production of uh, empathy, fears almost for the threat for the world that it has created that is also so much bigger than the actual animal, but it's a world of a human scale. Um, how does it, like, how do you kind of like create those worlds and what does it mean this kind of like moment when the world of the turtle, the reality and the subjectivity or the, the, the animal instinct of the turtle actually opens up an animal instinct to the human as well? Yeah, um, really briefly, the turtle is a, uh, a background character in a previous work I did called Life After Ba, which was a 50 minute long anime with human characters. And I wanted to create a, story for this turtle, but the turtle's life is very slow. Turtle's metabolism is slow. Turtles live very long times across generations. Not the only way to tell the story of a turtle is to simulate it and to make the drama of its life all the micro dramas. So going across the room to get some crumbs or trying to find a warm spot to sleep in become the drama of its day. And there are some human characters that come into the simulation and like maybe drop a bag or move the turtle. And this becomes a huge drama for its day that has to negotiate and um, survive. I was it's got kind of a scale shift. Because it reminded me very often, like the, the also the, the works which are uh, here, like uh, Fujiko's work or Philip's work, which deal with an environment which is like uh, imperceptible, necessary from our point of view, but it becomes an element of uh, blockage or an element of invisibility or an element of uh, surprise, and then you kind of like put all of these things like what is the scale of the human in relationship to what else? What else is there? What is we know? We don't know. We, we understand. We, we, perceive in some sense or not also. Yeah. And I was thinking this morning, it's kind of infinite also. Like, yeah. uh, it's of course infinite, you know, through AI. And Rachel, your work is also infinite, but in a very analog way. So it's a kind of a different form. I mean, you said in your statement, I'm thinking about how we experience or try to experience infinite space and time through the most finite and also basic methods. And you came here actually for a site visit and uh, it was an incredible process because you developed many, many photographs during that site visit. And the idea was always to kind of bring those into a dissemination. Can you tell us about what time is heaven? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is this on? Okay. Um, so I came here for one day and I shot all the photographs in that one day. And the idea was to look at the spaces within the biler that are normally under considered like the bathroom or the hallway or, um, a little spot next to a tree or something and kind of animate it through the camera um, using fog and a butterfly, which was a kind of note to the show to come. Um, and so you'll see, even though the photographs were taken months before the show happened, uh, it feels like I'm interweaving aspects of the artist's works into the photographs. And um, I decided to use kind of like the trope of horror. Uh, so a lot of backlight silhouettes, of course, haze machines, uh, sort of like thickening the air, um, uh, looking at, again, these kind of detritus spaces, like the basement, um, as a way to find uh, a different version, an extended version of the biler in the photographs. 
And also, it's kind of a lot of things. I mean, I, I think I know the space reasonably well here, you know, having installed shows previously. We worked here with Simon and Gerhard Richter show. Uh, so I spent, you know, many weeks installing here. But I kind of, through your photographs, saw a lot of things I really had never seen. Certain details of the elevator, hallways, you know, backlit situations. So it's also kind of making the invisible visible. It shows us aspects maybe of the institution we, we don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of uh, partly what the cinematic can offer. The photographs are cinematic. They're not sort of everyday snapshots. They're they're kind of within a a kind of framework that, yeah, that's what that can offer us. The title? Oh, the title? Well, um, I don't know. It just came to me and felt right that any any time can be heaven. It's interesting because you said that the, you took the photographs before the exhibition had opened, and obviously it feels like they are they have happened just when the exhibition opened. But to me, they also by looking at again at the little booklet which has the photographs, it's it, it, I, it makes me feel like I am after the exhibition already, like it has something which is completely crossing through temporality, and there's so much temporality in the exhibition that I think they idea of the publication in a space where books have been made, where time is conceived in different realities and where temporality is extended, is really what makes so important in, the, in this work, what time is heaven. You want to say a little bit about the temporality in this work? Mm. Yeah, I think also the, the feeling that like it captures the exhibition after it's gone, like we'll still have the book yeah. um, to remember. And maybe also this kind of like, uh, personal temporality, things that interest me, like Philippe's uh, Lily Ponds, which are one of my favorite works, Lily Pads, I'm sorry. It's one of my favorite works of all time, which has always, or been here for a long time now, right? Maybe over 10 years, I don't, sure. yeah, some time. It's like, um, you know, I, I probably spent a quarter of the day just with them, and, and, and they end up in the book as, as one photograph and then a few around them, but um, in a way it's also capturing like a personal temporality or a personal perspective on the bylaw. Um, and, and, and the limit of shooting within one day is part of that. You know, I had to choose wisely how I was spending my time. Yeah. And spending time brings us right away to recruit <laughs> because we are invited to spend a lot of time and it's uh, slow cooking. So it uh, liberates time and we can stay there and have conversations. It's a pretext also really to hang out in the exhibition and spend more time. It's always the idea. I mean, this is an exhibition one can visit again and again. The exhibition also keeps changing. So we hope you can all come back, you know, many times this summer uh, and see the evolution. And of course, with your piece, one can always spend time. Can you tell us about the choice of this terrazza, you know, for slow cooking? And also, you said that staying in place might mean staying with your own thoughts, even if the body keeps traveling. Well, uh, hello. Yeah. I'm just worried about that bell ringing. <laughs> uh, no, so really this terrazzo, I mean this place, this space is a, like kind of non-space. And, um, and it was a real problem for me to deal with because it's not really an exhibition space and it's not a space a lot of people even know. But then it was kind of like, uh, yeah, it's a kind of like the periphery that maybe it's interesting to like have an experience with. Actually, it, I mean, and the three, I mean, as I we're looking and thinking about the work of the three of us, I was thinking about this show like 30 years ago in uh, Hamburg in Kunstverein, which was like the Kunstverein Hamburg had a new building and they invited us to come and do this show called Backstage. And of course, the idea was that we would like be working in the building in all parts of the building because it wasn't really officially open. And and I think in, in that situation, I also thought a lot about the people who would be living and working in this building on a daily basis, you know? So a part of what I kind of started to think about was how this space would be used by like people who were working here. And I think it's also kind of in my back of my head, knowing so many people here, having been here, worked here, that you know, uh, maybe it's good to make a, like a nice lounge for people to go and sit and smoke and have some time away from the art. 
There is also mushrooms, Swiss <laughs> mushrooms, <laughs> sandwiches. We have a, a very slow cooked pork, and um, and I mean, you know, the, the idea was that like you would. Uh, well, I found I just discovered this uh, old smoking machine, which is like um, I, I use it at home, and of course it would take like you know eight hours to cook something in. So I thought, okay, you know they could put the the, the pork in or whatever that we want to cook uh, the night before, and then the next morning they would have a ready you know meal so that when everyone shows up to work they would have a nice sandwich to eat. And uh, I, I have you, have you haven't been out there, you, you know, the, there is now available like little sandwiches that you can have a little taste. Uh, and as the bell hasn't gone yet, I think we do have the opportunity. Vasilis and you are... <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, let's have, do two I minutes. I have one last question Vasilis for everyone. Because and you are working on a show for Al. And I think it's interesting for everyone to hear about that because it's opening super soon and everybody, you know, could actually come and see it. Well, a, a lot of people is uh, the um, retrospectives or the, the, the exhibition which was uh, initiated at PS1 in New York, at MoMA PS1 recently, uh, last year. And we will be showing it in Al uh, in a space where um, uh, it's so close to many of Rikrit's works as well. We have commissioned Rikrit for Luma uh, with a number of works uh, which are part of the architecture and the lived experience of the building. So it's like it's a, a, an incredible opportunity to be able to show the many years of his practice and his career and everything that has happened from the personal and intimate moments that became significant artworks to the experiences and the activation of events, which also become continue to live in memories and in, 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 in objects and in, uh, in uh, uh, f records uh, everywhere in the world. But also what is interesting is the, the political layer of everything that is happening, which is very kind of like interesting in the work that you are doing, not only with uh, art, with creating art, but also empowering artists as well. And I think this is also the most, the most important. But before we close, I have one question for each one of you, because I know that there were numerous titles, that there were, were questions of titles. How would you title the exhibition here? Uh, well, I like Precious's like last name, so I took the Mon from that, and I would do like Summer Show Mon. <laughs> and you can, That's great. Yeah, it can be Sam Keller Mon, and Precious Okiyomon, and Hans Ulrich Oberstoman, <laughs> Sam Keller Mon. That's great. Rachel? Pass. I don't know. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I. I mean, I. I wrote up many titles because there was a kind of request about this That's idea great. of titles, <laughs> and the one that we put up today is uh, the richness of going slow. That's great. And I think that I mean, you know, and I. I hope everyone goes slow because you know all this artwork is being moved around, and you really need to take your time to walk around. You know, of course, the the, the installers and. But also to go slow, to go through the show and see the, everything in a, in, a, in a different speed because here's an opportunity to actually, yeah, because in a way they're giving us time to deal with it. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You so Thank you so much.